So, in the next hour, we'd like uh, to open the floor up uh, for some candid conversation uh, with a patient panel. And first, I would like to introduce Mr. Gary Murphy, a board director with Alpha One Canada, and as a patient himself. He'll be leading our patient panel today and also sharing his unique patient perspective. Gary. Uh, joining Gary on the stage, we will uh, be bringing up Mr. Dave Carter. Somewhere, there's Dave. Dave had, is a, uh, had a double lung transplant in April 2015. And we have a special guest, uh, Kristen O'Sullivan and her son, Declan. Uh, Declan was liver, had a liver transplant at the age of three. Uh, Kristen is a carrier and she was the uh, live donor. Come on up, Kristen and Declan. Take it away. Have a seat. <laughs> we'll, we'll hit you with questions and we'll get your story here in, in just a minute. Oh, it's okay. You can sit on my lap. This is perfect right here. No, I. Okay. Huh? I was going to say, you want to sit on your lap? Fine. Hey, buddy. As Angela said, uh, my name is Gary. I'm a director with uh, Alpha One, I'm a Zad Zad carrier. And I'm as healthy as a horse. Uh, my FEV1 that we heard earlier didn't mean a whole lot. I'm in the high 90s and uh, I exercise. Exercise, that's my medication. Uh, my doctor told me that uh, it can do a, a lot to prevent my disease from, or our disease, from uh, getting a hold on me. And we looked at two sides of the coin. Uh, I'm here today because I did everything the doc said. My sister died at 44. She never exercised, she smoked, drank like a fish, and didn't take her medications. So uh, exercise is what I do. It uh, doesn't sound as exotic as uh, a lot of the drugs that uh, most of you are on, especially I'm sure uh, Declan and, and Dave with the anti-rejection drugs. In the long run, it can be quite important. Sorry. Exercise does many amazing things uh, for all humans, not just us alphas, but in our case, the short and long-term prognosis can be positively affected by our exercise or lack thereof. Some of the tangible benefits are, the exercise removes the ex excess adipose tissue from our abdomen, Dunlop's disease, and uh, <coughs> because, because of this, uh, with our flattened diaphragm that we're going to develop, uh, we don't want anything else to interfere with our, our breathing. And that's another reason why they, they will suggest having small meals instead of our usual three large meals a day. As you can see on the left, that's a re regular inhale. You can see how the abdomen's flattened out. Over here, when you exhale, it goes upwards. And if you've got a big belly sitting down here, <laughs> you can see that you're not going to be able to flatten it. So you're going to be permanently in exhale mode. When exercising, the cardiorespiratory system is pretty amazing. It responds to our uh, demands that we put on it for oxygen by building up its, com its capacity to deliver that uh, oxygen. The heart becomes more efficient, and a uh, unhealthy heart, it squeezes lightly just barely squeezes. But a healthy heart that you develop through exercise, it can really put a good squeeze on and fire the blood out to the body. Your muscles are gonna become more efficient. Like if you're just starting off exercising, your, your, your legs will get tired, your arms will get tired, they'll start screaming for oxygen. But over time, you think you're getting more fit, but what happens is the muscles get more efficient in the use of oxygen. So they'll demand less oxygen, so our damaged lungs don't have to provide as much. So we're helping ourselves by exercising. 
The improved efficiency of the heart muscles, lungs, and muscle tone resulting from the exercise will allow our body to better fight off infections. And we all know what, how bad we get set back when we have an exasperation. In the event of a transplant, like they're going to talk about here shortly, uh, you'll have a much better surgical prognosis and a faster recovery. Another thing, uh, exercise will improve your self-confidence. As you see, you see yourself meeting your goals, and some people are going to have goals that are more loftier than, than ours. You know, like uh, there are people out there that are hoping to run uh, marathons and Ironman triathlons. But if your goal is to run 100 feet, that's still a good goal. It'll also reduce or eliminate anxiety attacks. Uh, physicians have said that uh, the best Prozac out there is just exercise. Let's say, I'm just going to catch up here. <laughs> exercise is also a great deterrent and treatment for depression, which anyone or, uh, with or anticipated debilitating medical prognosis is prone to. When I was first told about that I had alpha-1, uh, like most of you, I was told that I only had a couple years left to live. There was nothing really they could do for me. Uh, one of the quotes that uh, I tell just about everybody, my doctor looked me square in the face and said, you have our RSPs, you're not going to need them. So obviously I got a little bit depressed. And if I hadn't started running, uh, I would have been on many medications. So this exercise thing sounds great, doesn't it? Where do I sign up? But with everything related to treatment, sorry, with everything related to treatment of alpha-1, there has to be informed consent. Usually that means the patient's informed consent. In this case, it's going to be your primary care physician or your respirologist's consent. You're going to want to tell them because they may want to change some of your drugs or there may even be a rehab program that they can enroll you in so that you can get started properly uh, on, on your road to uh, fitness. Is it hard to start? Yes, I won't lie to you, it, it is hard. At the beginning, your body's going to hate you for what you're going to make it do. Uh, you've been on a couch for a while, and if you've not been exercising at all, you're going to have aches, you're going to have pains, and you're going to have self-doubt. But among people that exercise, those are badges of honor. All athletes get, do get them, even Michael Phelps. And is it worth it? Most definitely, yes. And for that, I just go back to the difference between my sister and myself. Do you need expensive gear or do you need to run? Nope and nope. Gear first, wear what's comfortable. Uh, the technical gear that you see all the, the runners or, or joggers out wearing is designed to make them comfortable first and dry. Uh, secondly, they, they want to be seen. They don't want to get hit by a car. The clothes are designed to wick sweat and that has the effect of keeping you warm or cool depending on the season. And the summer keeps you cool, and the winter keeps you warmer, and it all comes down to because of the sweat. Uh, the dryness also prevents chafing. Do you need these fancy clothes? Well, that depends. If you're at the point where your goal is just to walk 500 meters, and I'm sorry I shouldn't have said just, uh, if your goal is to walk 500 meters, that's a very admirable goal. You don't need them. You just need to be comfortable. But you can use them as a motivator. Because more than once I've, I've made a goal to myself, if I can run 10 kilometers, I'm going to go out and get myself a new uh, water belt. Uh, the most important thing is wear what's comfortable. I will advise you to go to a running store and get your feet and stride uh, assessed. Uh, all of us are different, every single one of us. And if you don't buy, you don't need to buy the footwear there, but you should go and get assessed because uh, feet go in three ways. They either go neutral, which is straightforward, they pronate, which means they roll in, or they supinate, they roll out. And if you choose the wrong uh, sneaker or running shoe or walking shoe uh, without uh, an insert or, or orthotics, what you're going to end up doing is causing hip pain, knee pain, shin pain, and we don't want you to get uh, discouraged and give up, so we want to eliminate all discomforts. Now, excuses, there's millions. I've used just about all of them. I know running or walking gear is too tiny. You know, out of, I'm, I'm out of shape. I don't want people, people to see me in spandex. I'm guilty of that one. Uh, 
Uh, I don't want people uh, to see me jiggle. And I probably got them all. But runners and walkers have a specially designed piece of equipment that you can all go out and purchase relatively cheap. It's called a running jacket. Uh, it's highly visible, it's waterproof, quite loose fit. Uh, it'll hide all your jiggles. It's got under, underarm zips, so that helps you vent sweat and keep dry. And best of all, it has a bum flap. So nobody from behind can see your behind. <laughs> the hardest part of the exercise regime is getting out the door. Uh, every time I get up in the morning, I've already got pre-planned excuses why I can't go for a, a, a run today. I'm at the point where I'm running, but if, if you're going out for a walk, you're going to have pre-planned excuses. Your mind comes up with them at night because I said a minute or so ago that uh, your body doesn't want to do this. Uh, but if you can make a commitment to yourself or a running buddy that you will run or walk 10 minutes every day, and that's all I'm asking, just 10 minutes, and that's not a whole lot of time out of a day. If you can do those 10 minutes uh, and honestly uh, uh, give it up and at the end of the 10 minutes you don't want to go another one minute, that's fine. You can stop and go on back home. But at this point, you're dressed, you're out there, you're 10 minutes from home, so now I got a 10 minute walk out of you, 20 minute walk out of you, and that's pretty sneaky. <clears throat> okay, once you get out the door, what do you do? Start slow. No matter how slow you're going, you're going too fast. Uh, your body's going to tell you when to slow down, but you should be able to carry on a normal conversation at all times. And if you're able to jog, keep the pace slow enough so that you can carry on a conversation or sing along with your iPod. Remember, when you turn around to go back home, you're only halfway there. So when you get back, you've got to have enough gas in the tank to get back home. And when you finally do get back home, you still should have some stuff left uh, in the tank so that you could say that I could have gone a little bit farther. One thing that you do have to do is set a concrete goal, because if you set a concrete goal, it's measurable. If I say I'm going to run or walk 20 minutes, well, when I'm done, I can look at my watch and say, I met my goal or I didn't meet my goal. Uh, if you're just going to say, I'm going to walk every day, well, to you, what's a walk? Is it you know, 10 meters, 50 meters? Keep a running diary, and that is quite important because uh, it'll tell you what sort of weathers you're running in. It's great to look back on because you can look at the mileages that you've done over time and that there's a great motivator as well. But the thing is, if you keep a diary, it'll tell you when you're going to get sick. Uh, if your mileages are dropping off or you're finding it more difficult to, to exercise walking or running or swimming, well, it's a clue that my, bo my body's fighting off an infection or something. Maybe I need to start taking a day off, or maybe I need to go see a doctor. Uh, I use a cell phone app. It's called RunKeeper. It's free, and it's kind of neat because it has a GPS. It activates the GPS in the phone, so I don't have to use a, a pedometer or anything. It tells me how far I've gone. I can make notes at the end of the run, like I was saying. You know, like my shins are, or at the end of the walk, my shins are, are acting up, or uh, maybe I need new sneakers, or. Uh, great run today. I can listen to music, which I love, and uh, if I get that 10 minutes out and I'm really uh, sucking wind, I can phone somebody to come pick me up. And setbacks, you should expect them. You're going to have them. Uh, we all have alpha, so we're, we are going to get sick, unfortunately. And just this past Christmas, I had uh, uh, Mycobacterium avium, it's a bacteria that grows in your lungs, and pneumonia. I had them both at the same time. And I couldn't get upstairs from downstairs without almost turning blue. And if the house caught fire, I wouldn't have got from the bedroom to the kitchen trying to run. When you get better, most likely uh, you're going to have to start all over again, right back from square one. And don't get discouraged about that. It happens to everybody. And when you do uh, start over, do so knowing that your sickness was probably less acute because you were exercising and it was shorter lived than if you had not been exercising. Okay, hang on here, let me catch up. Okay, the nitty gritty. If you're only able to go to the end of your driveway, starting out, that there is your goal. It's a perfectly fine goal, and a couple laps of the driveway, it'll add up. You don't want to be 
uh, doing a loop circuit where you get in trouble halfway through your run. Uh, you want to remain safe, you want to remain healthy. Don't overdo it because if you overdo it, you'll get discouraged and you won't want to continue. And like I apologized earlier, try not to use the words just or only. Be proud of what you're accomplishing. I've heard runners state that they're only doing the half marathon or I'm just doing the half. And if you look at it, that's 16 kilometers more than I can do right now. Get a running or a walking buddy because if I'm accountable to somebody else, and I just found out that Dave is from the same town I'm in, uh, if I'm telling him that I'm going running tomorrow or I'm gonna go for a walk tomorrow and I'm talking to him tomorrow evening and he, did you go? Well, now I feel a little bit uh, down in the mouth because I let him down as well as myself. So they'll hold you accountable and they'll get you out. If you're not feeling great, maybe they're feeling great and they're gonna have the, uh, the encouragement to get you to go. Also be advised, we're in Canada, winter's coming. Uh, your local mall is a great place to walk if you're not a member of a gym. I know a lot of gym memberships are quite expensive. Or if you got to the point where you, you want to uh, jog or run, uh, check out the local rink because they usually have a walking track or running track around the top of the rink uh, that in many places is free to use. Be creative. Uh, you, there's no need to be out in Mother Nature with the icy roads and the cold air. We're going to get these lovely people to tell their story and then we're going to take questions. So if you want to go first, Kristen. Okay. Uh, hello. <laughs> my name is Kristen, and this is my son. And what's your name? Declan. Declan. And Declan um, was diagnosed when he was three and a half months old with Alpha 1 after presenting with jaundice for three and a half months. Um, he, he was actually an SZ, and both his father and I are carriers. Um, when Declan was, um, was three, he had to have his liver transplanted. And that was just due to the, the cirrhosis that had developed in his liver. Um, it was also after a skin infection that just wouldn't go away. And it, it then developed into a raging infection inside of his body. Um, it was very severe, very scary. And it was at that point that his liver started to fail. Um, and the doctors informed us that it was that time Declan needed to have uh, his liver transplanted. Uh, Declan, um, I'm his donor, so we were able to do that quite quickly after the workup. Um, and Declan has been four years come October post-transplant. Um, he then now has my uh, MZ because I am the donor, um, but. Declan is living a very healthy life uh, after his transplant. Um, transplant, I'm so I'm th thrilled to know that there's more um, advances to not have a transplant because there is so many uh, post-complicated related <sighs> headaches that come with it. Um, Everyone in this room is dealing with their own sort of trauma, and, uh, and it doesn't stop after the transplant. It's, it can continue. Um, I guess what I really wanted to kind of convey to everyone uh, was about community and how to gather supports around you. Um, Alpha One is, is our community um, putting into um, putting our input, our voice, what it is that we need to get out of Alpha One. These are everything that you can direct um, to the organization. They're there to support us, to help us. Um, we've got a wonderful kids program now um, continuing. We will uh, do more of the parent groups. It's very helpful. 
um, support also comes through social workers. And this is a key point that a lot of parents are not aware of, that um, through your local hospital, um, through sick kids, um, every every hospital, even your local clinics, will have a, uh, a social worker. And they're not there to judge you. Um, for your bad days. Um, they are there to support you. They are there to help talk between you and your doctor. Doctors, they can be um, so untouchable in many ways. And so that social worker there, for everyone here, is to, to talk, to communicate to you what it is that you need to get out so that you're not so emotional maybe when you're talking to that doctor. They can bridge that and then they can then take that information back from the doctor and um, present it in a way that is, that is more understandable for you. Um, and the third, the third and most important support is at home. It's in your, it's in your home community. It's your friends, it's your family. Um, it's any other local support groups out there that are dealing with chronic illness, chronic disease, pain. Um, the local health units um, always have support groups like that. Um, family and friends, it's um, you yourself get sick, but then also your caregivers get sick as well and um, having a support system for yourself but also for those caregivers is really important. Um, and then going back to the Alpha One community and even the social workers and support groups, knowing that's not living what you're going through will really understand you. Um, so it is really important to have the Alpha One support group. It is really important to have your social worker that you can talk to. I talk to my, I have great girlfriends, um, but there's just some things I, I don't, I don't want to burden them with my pains. Um, and that is what the social worker is there to do. Um, and I think that's, that's just kind of what I wanted to convey. Again, um, everyone has their personal story, everyone has their personal traumas and everything. And, um, and it's not to ignore that, that is very valid and you do need to speak about that. And, and through that is the Alpha One community, the social workers, and then your, your support network at home. Is there anything that you wanna say, Declan? Not right now, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty brave boy. Do you want Pretty to great boy. Yeah. 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 Well, as you know, uh, I'm a transplant recipient, and uh, gotta say, it's probably the most amazing experience ever. Uh, yeah, being sick with the Alpha, you, you have so many questions, and you feel so down, and you're so depressed, and that. And you have to realize that this is the hand you're dealt. So what are you going to do? And basically, you just got to get up and get going. Got to exercise. Like Gary said, like you got to exercise. And if you're as fit as you possibly can, and you do need to to get the transplant when you get to that point, you want to be as fit as you can because you're more likely to survive. If you have all the other problems or, uh, you know, or if you just don't exercise or you're just not strong or whatever your problem might be, you have to improve on what you already have. When you get the transplant, you know, bless the doctors that can do this sort of thing because it, it's, I went from not being able to walk 10 feet And I think about that now, 10 feet, you know, I'm 270 pounds and I can't walk 10 feet. Who's going to carry me? I got brothers as big as me and they say, forget it. You know, you're in a chair 
And as it was, when I got to Toronto for my transplant, I was in a chair. So I had the transplant, and four days afterwards, for the first time in probably 12 years, I walked 100 meters. Wow. Next day, I walked 300. Third day, I walked 500. Canada Day, I did 10 kilometers. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> but having said that, you know, you have your transplant, you do the things that they tell you, and what do you do then? Well, you have to go to the gym. And it's, for me, it's two, three times a week, constantly. And there's days when you just do not feel like it. Forget it. So I would have those days. I said, oh, you know, and what Gary says, you can think of an excuse. I can name thousands more. And I got to the point where I actually put a treadmill by my back door. Because the days when I decided I wasn't going to the gym, I go, oh, guilt trip, right? And I kept my gym bag by the other door. I was not getting away from it. So two to three times a week at the gym. And I'm thankful for it, because like now, I can walk for miles. Most people that walk with me are tired before I am. I'm sort of like, okay, let's go, you know? Can you keep up? You know, and all of a sudden you feel normal, somewhat. You know, you do your medications and you, you know, continue to do your exercise, eat right, which, you know, forget who does that, right? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but overall, like, you know, it's not something to be afraid of if you have to go for transplant or, you're, or you've thought about it. Um, I near jumped up on the gurney when they did, I got the call. I was so happy. But, uh, you know, it's well worth it. Um, unfortunately, if we have to go that route, that's the hand we're dealt. But, uh, you know, be prepared. If, if that's where you're headed, you know, you know, get up off your tail. But, uh, and the other thing I, I would think is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that you run into. Like, we're a small family of alphas and uh, even a smaller family of transplant people and we, we tend to migrate to each other and you'll notice that if you've had a transplant you'll be sitting in the middle of a coffee shop somewhere and sit next to somebody and all the other seats are empty but for some reason you sat next to that person and chances are they they've been touched by a transplant either themselves or, or a family member or somebody they know and and like everyone that I see and I talk to, uh, like uh, I encourage people for, you know, be a donor. You know, where we come from in Nova Scotia, uh, we're one of the worst provinces for having registered donors. And yet we, we have one of the highest per capita needs of people that require organs. So, you know, for us as a, a community of alphas who talk to other alphas or transplant people talk to other people <coughs> contemplating transplants, we need to like sort of encourage people to, you know, change their outlook and, and do it, you know, because overall, you know, most of us in this room who are alphas who are, if you're getting the therapy, you may end up waiting for the transplant, you know. It's a sorry thing to say, but, uh, you know, if we face our realities, it, it is easier. In the long run. But hopefully, you know, we can open some eyes and maybe even change how our government does things too. So who knows? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions from for either of us? Good morning. For the gentleman to the right, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Oh, Dave. Dave, could you tell us what kind of your exercise regimen it is at the gym, how long your sessions are, and how you started out? Well, Just to give us a detail. Um, I started off on the treadmill. I do a half an hour. 
and then I do 10 different uh, machines, you know, for weights and that. I, I, I do um, like a back press, I do uh, three reps of 12 on the back press, and, uh, and like in a short period, and quite honestly, when I started in the gym, I was very weak, you know, like, I've been sick with this since like 1998, and just progressively got weaker, thinner, you name it, and uh, so when I started in the gym, like on the back press, I was doing like 60, 70 pounds. Now the thing doesn't carry enough weight for me, and that's 245 pounds I can push. And I do leg press. Uh, I do about 370 pounds on that, and I started off at 50. You know, and this is only since October, so we're, we're coming up close to a year now. But uh, so there's a back press, there's a leg press, there's uh, ones where I I exercise my my quads. Uh, I get off of that, and I do um, squats. You know, and everything that I do, it, it works at about 36 reps in total for each machine, 10 machines. So, you know, my regimen takes me a little over two hours to do. So, two hours of my time, so what, right? You can sit easily in front of the TV for two hours, so, you know, get up. Another so question? This is a question for Declan uh, about the Canadian transplant games he was at. Tell him about the transplant games. What did you do at the transplant games? Swimming, swim race, bowling, walk race, then normal race. And did you win anything? You <laughs> medal. Three gold and one silver. Whoa. One silver at bowling. <laughs> we have Very another good. question. Gary, um, thank you all of you, but when you were talking, Gary, and you said that when you're walking, you should be able to carry on a normal conversation. So I can't do that. And um, like um, that frustrates me, but I did, um, respiratory rehab on the treadmill and so I'm doing a lot better than I was with no slope but like um, time and um, like instead of 0.6 like 2.3 or whatever but I can't talk when I'm walking so okay. I wonder if maybe like I'm doing something wrong no um, that is a general thing that they they use for unfortunately the healthy people uh, the idea is they want you to go slow enough that you're not overwhelming your body trying to breathe. Because you'll see a lot of runners out there, they're panting like uh, they're running from the devil. You shouldn't be at that point. Uh, so that's why they say you should be going at a speed where you, where you can uh, 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 speak. Okay. Because if, if you can speak, you're getting enough air in to keep your body going. You don't want, you don't want to be uh, uh, going to the point where your, your muscles are starved for oxygen. Well, I think probably I talk enough, so maybe I just don't need to talk when I'm walking. <laughs> Thank you. I do that it, on the treadmill. Uh, Does anyone have any other questions? A couple of falls sit beside me. We, uh, we talk constantly. Yeah. And the treadmill's boring, by the way. In case you haven't, if any of you haven't, you know, try it, you know. But uh, I usually when I'm in the gym, there's uh, one or two fellows that we're usually there about the same time. And... We talked the whole time, and you know, you look down and say, "Oh, my my half hour is done, <laughs> All right?" So it, it does help you pass the time. Or if you can't talk while you do it, that's fine. If you, but like Gary says, you know, go at a speed that uh, you're not like huffing and puffing and like, oh, you know, you know, working so hard that all you can do is concentrating and getting a breath. Right? You should be able to just do it normally and. You know, just do it so normally that, you know, it's just your legs burning, you know, and that's, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, difficult, but, you know, you, you just tend to pace yourself. That's what it is. But important to just do it, you know, Nike, hey. 
And I'm also saying that with a caveat because there was just a research paper that came out that said you should be stressing your body to the point where you can't talk. I don't know if how that affects alphas because that was for the general population. So I don't know how that affects us. Uh, uh, I do know there's somebody here in the room that I can harass after and ask uh, their opinion of it. We have another question over here. Uh, just, just a comment. I'm, I'm an alpha and I've also had a lung transplant. But previous to that for many years, uh, walking, there was no way I'm talking while I'm walking. Um, it, I needed all of my breath and all the oxygen I could get in to supply my muscles. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I should go slower. It just okay. meant that I should walk through that and not talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, do as much as you can, as you say, without, without uh, killing yourself and, and so that to the point where you're panting and beyond. But you walk hard enough that you're pushing for breath. Just not too much. Okay. You find that spot where you're, where you're just running along the edge but not falling over. That's, That's it. Always, always a little tricky. But it, unless you do that, you're not working your muscles enough because the, the natural inclination is to, is to just back off. Yeah, that's what this study keep, was saying. Yeah, if you just keep backing off and backing off pretty soon, you're on the couch. Mm. So, just, just that comment. Any other comments or questions? Thank you to our patient panel. I think um, we all agree that uh, we should encourage everyone here and our friends and family to obviously sign their donor cards and express their wishes to their families. Um, Thank you, Gary, Kristen, Declan, and Dave.